You please people. All of you do. But does that make you a people pleaser? So this week at work, if you go to work, I hope that your boss was pleased with you. I hope that you worked fervently as unto the Lord. I hope your boss saw that and was pleased with your work. I hope that if you interacted with customers directly, they were pleased with the output of your labor. I hope that there are husbands in this room who did the dishes this week and pleased their wife by doing it. And I hope that there are wives here who gave a solid, true compliment to their husbands this week, much to his pleasure. I hope that we, when we interact with each other as brothers and sisters, are pleasing on the whole to one another, speaking words that build up and that encourage and that help. We do that, don't we? If you don't please anybody, you are probably doing something wrong. We do please people. Then why is it that all of us know when we say the phrase people pleaser that that is wrong, that we should not do that? In a literal sense, we do that. But we mean something else by the phrase people pleasing, and that's exactly what we're talking about today. There is a difference between pleasing people in a good way and pleasing people in a bad way. We will call it good people pleasing and bad people pleasing. Do not be too complicated here. What is it that separates these two things? To make it as simple as possible, it's this. If you please someone else for their benefit, that's good. If you please someone else only for your benefit, that is bad. They're both pleasing, but there is a difference. So, as an example, if I this week give you a compliment based on something true that I see the Holy Spirit of God doing in your life, I observe it and I tell you about it, in order to help you be encouraged, because maybe you don't see it, I pleased you with that comment, and it was good. If, on the other hand, I don't see that in your life, but you have something that I want, maybe it's just your good opinion of me, maybe it's you're wealthier or well-off than I am, I want you to use your funds for my benefit, whatever it may be, and I say this thing to you, true or not, but it's not because I want to benefit you. It's because I want through you to benefit me. That's bad. We call that flattery. And that's a sin. Can't do that. They're both compliments. They both please the other person. But one's a good people pleasing. One is a bad people pleasing. The reason for this distinction is simple enough. If you just think about the core aim of your entire life given to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, we make it our aim to please God. That's your primary aim in life, is to be a God pleaser. But as you are, in a sense, riding your ship along the waves in the age of sail, and you're going along in the direction of pleasing God with your life, of doing His will, there are times where to please God requires that you please other people. God wants you to build up and benefit and help other people. And oftentimes, there's a direct way to do this by pleasing the other person. Not always, but oftentimes. So in that sense, it's as if you're on your boat, destination pleasing God, and sometimes you will find the wind of opinion, the wind of people being pleased is behind you in your sails, pushing you in the direction of pleasing God. That's when you observe in a brother or sister something true and say it for their encouragement. It's pushing you along in the direction of pleasing God. But in this life, it's not always that way. And many times the wind turns around and the pleasure of people blows against your sails. What do you do in that case? Your ultimate aim is still to please God. So if to please God requires you to move that way, but you know it's going to offend someone and their pleasure is blowing that way, 
then you're going to have to zigzag your way upwind, as unpleasant as that is, and continue toward your destination against the winds that are against you. That's what helps you to distinguish between good people-pleasing and bad people-pleasing. I'm just wanting to point out here that there is a distinction there because it's going to come up as we look at our text today. That there is a good people-pleasing and there is a bad people-pleasing. And we typically reserve the term people-pleasing, as I have in my title, for the bad. So I'm not saying be a people-pleaser in a bad sense. But we'll talk about the good and the bad as we move on. Because we're pausing today in verse 10 of Galatians 1. Because this is a verse some of you, I know I have, probably many of you have memorized when it comes to our struggles with bad people pleasing. Because hardly anywhere in the Bible is there such a clear single verse against bad people pleasing. And we have seen in our text as we've started Galatians last week that Paul was absolutely shocked that the Galatian churches that he had helped to plant, that those churches had turned so quickly away from the true gospel he presented to them and were turning, because of Judaizer false teachers, were turning away to a false gospel that added works in as necessary for salvation. He was shocked. And as he's expressing his shock, he got to the point where he declared an anathema or a curse upon anyone who adds to or alters the gospel and then... Somewhat out of the blue, for us, comes verse 10 on people-pleasing. Let's look at this verse 10 in Galatians 1. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please God? Man, if I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. This is a single verse that's made up of two questions and one hypothetical statement. There's actually no just clear assertion in this verse, but the meaning of it is absolutely clear. The questions are, am I? And then, am I? And then finally here, if I were, then. But it's obvious what he's saying, and what he's saying in this passage is don't be a bad people pleaser. Really what he's saying is that Paul, I, Paul, am not, but we learn from his example. I thought it was worth stopping to focus just on this verse, partly because it stands by itself in the text and so deserves a sermon, but also because I've often told people, some of you, that when I'm thinking of us as a local body, if I want to know the strengths and the weaknesses of our local body, I kind of just look at my own strengths and weaknesses. There is some difference, but I'm such a product of this church. I've been here quite a long time and have been so intermeshed with the life of this local body that usually, overall, the things I'm strong in, we're strong in. And the things I'm weak in, we're weak in. Not as much because you're following me as it is because I'm following you and we're following each other as believers. And so when it comes to the matter of people pleasing, many of you already know that this is my particular Ephesian beast that I wrestle with the most. This is the sin that I have the hardest time fighting and do fight. I think that we as a local body struggle with this sin. We're unlikely, let me say, as a local body, to be tempted to go out there and riot and loot and burn things. It's probably not going to be us. Maybe somebody else somewhere else maybe is tempted with that. We're going to be tempted to be bad people pleasers. To not do what we should because we don't want to displease someone. To do what we shouldn't do because we don't want to displease someone. To not be pleasing people always for their benefit fit, but in some way for our own. I think it's worth it to stop and spend time on this verse for all of our good, because we need this. And so what we're going to look at in this passage is two things. One, we're going to consider people pleasing, which we've already begun to talk about. And then at the end, somewhat briefly, we're going to turn and focus on how we can please Christ instead of people. Be Christ pleasers. So let's begin by looking at this subject of people pleasing. And may the Holy Spirit work mightily in us as we do it. 
the very first thing in this text we have to deal with is that first word, for. You know from studying scripture and language that if you start a sentence with something like for or even and, you're connecting it to what came just before. And what came just before, if you look at verses 8 and 9, is Paul declaring twice, let him be accursed. If we or an angel from heaven declare to you a different gospel than the one you've received, let him be accursed. And then finally in verse 9, if anyone, and he's looking at the Judaizers, anyone, if anyone proclaims to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be anathema, let him be accursed. Then he starts this text with, for, am I now seeking the approval of people or of God? First thing we have to do is see why are those connected. Really, excuse me, there are three possible ways how these are connected in Paul's mind. Here's the simplest way. Anathema to I don't please people. What's the connection? Here's the first possibility. It might be that Paul has just said something so strong. He's just offended, in a sense, the Galatians. I'm surprised you're doing this. He's just said something offensive to the Judaizers. So he could get a response like Jesus did when he gave a hard saying. And his disciples said, do you know the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Jesus knew that they were offended, and he didn't care. Paul could be responding to a similar sort of sense. Do you know that when you say anathema on those Judaizers, that's really offensive? Paul may be saying, well, anathema on them, for I don't care. For am I a servant of people? Am I seeking the approval of people? No, I'm seeking the approval of God. That might be the connection. On the other hand, it might be in Paul's mind that the connection between anathematizing the Judaizers and not being a people pleaser is that he's putting himself in contrast to the Judaizers. He's calling them out. They're preaching a different gospel. And Paul says, but for me, for I am not seeking the approval of people like the Judaizers are. And we mentioned this briefly already, but the Judaizers who said that basically if you want to be a true Christian and be saved, you have to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. You basically have to become a Jew. That's the Judaizers. Paul is going to make clear in this letter that the Judaizers were motivated in part by a desire for the approval of people. For example, we'll see in chapter 6, verse 12. Paul saying, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. A good showing. Look, everybody look. And only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Like we said previously, the Judaizers probably recognize that if they convert Gentiles to Jesus but they don't make them Jews, then the Jews will persecute them for doing that. They'll say you're part of a heresy, you're part of error. But if the Judaizers talk about Jesus, but say, but also the Jews are right, these are the works you have to do to be saved, be circumcised, etc. The Jews will say, that's fine. They just have a rabbi Jesus, but basically we're the same. Do the works, go to heaven. We're the same. But Paul says that is false. That's why he's persecuted. So the Judaizers do please people. The Judaizers were the patriotic ones. They were faithful and loyal to their kinsmen, and they considered Paul not to be, and therefore Paul was persecuted. The Judaizers probably weren't. So, after Paul anathematizes them, he might be saying, for, anathematize on them, for I'm not like them. Because do I serve people? No, I serve God. That's possible. Let me give you one last possibility here of the connection in the text. And that is, it is possible that the Judaizers charged Paul himself with people pleasing. No, it doesn't tell us that in the text, but it's possible when you read this. Because what the Judaizers may have been saying is that the Apostle Paul, 
telling the Galatians, the Apostle Paul, I know he came through, said you don't have to be circumcised, you don't have to keep the law of Moses to be saved, but trust us. Paul just does that when he's with Gentiles because he doesn't want to offend you. You really do, and he knows that, but he doesn't want to offend you. He wants your approval. He wants you to like him. So he doesn't tell you the hard truth that you have to be Jewish to be saved. They could point to things like the fact that Paul did have Timothy circumcised, remember? And Paul himself kept festivals, kept vows. He was keeping the law when he's with the Jewish people, but then when he's with Gentile people, now he's not. He's a people pleaser. It may be, therefore, that after Paul anathematizes them, he says, for, no, I'm not with them, for, I'm not a people pleaser. No matter what the Judaizers say, my gospel is salvation by grace alone, faith alone, no added works, even if they're pointing at me saying I'm a people pleaser. I'm not. Now, whichever of those views you take, because it is a little tough to know exactly what Paul's thinking here when he puts this verse in, the essence of what Paul means is exactly the same. It is. Galatians, you can absolutely trust my gospel because I've not changed it at all out of a desire for human approval. That's the point that Paul is making here. Now, that's a point that matters quite a lot to us because we receive the gospel by faith. We believe that it's true completely by faith, but on a human level, it does help us to know, since we receive the gospel through the Apostle Paul and his writings, it does help us to know on a human level that he didn't change it out of an inordinate desire for the approval of others. He simply spoke the truth he received from heaven. That's very good. But this helps us in another way, not just in our confidence, but this kind of a verse helps us by way of example. And maybe that's the primary way it's helpful to us as a local body is that Paul is an example to us in that he is not people-pleasing. So let's just take a moment here and focus on the example that Paul is. We believe the gospel. He didn't change it. But he's also an example in this passage of not being a bad people-pleaser. And let's just take a moment to observe that example and pray that God will apply it to ourselves so we would be like Paul in this. Now, I already told you that there is a bad kind of people-pleasing and a good. And the reason I told you that was so that you'll understand this verse as we describe it now. Because the fact of the matter is that Paul here uses two words to describe exactly what he does not do. He says in the text, he does not seek the approval of man. And number two, he does not try to please or please man. Seek the approval or please. If you look at the original words behind both of those, in other passages of Paul, he says those are things that he exactly does do. So let me give you the example. So seek the approval. He says, I do not seek the approval of man. The Greek word behind that is patho. I do not patho man. Here's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Paul says, therefore... Knowing the fear of the Lord, we patho others. And your translation will say something like, we persuade. When he says, seek the approval in our text, the idea is to win someone over via persuasion, to win them over. Paul says, I don't win people over. And then in 2 Corinthians, he says, knowing the fear of the Lord, we win people over. It's the same word. He says he does do it. He says he doesn't do it. Again, if we take please or try to please in our text, the Greek is oresko. I can give you two passages where Paul says that's exactly what he does do toward people. Here's 1 Corinthians 10.33. Just as I, oresko, try to please everyone in everything I do. That's a lot of people pleasing. Not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. And here's Romans 15, 1 and 2. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. 
if you can't distinguish between good people pleasing and bad people pleasing, you're just going to think Paul's contradicting himself. But seeing that Paul was a very well-educated man, let's at least give him the benefit of the doubt, even if we don't focus on inspiration at the moment. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt that he's able, like us, to use words in different contexts to mean different things. And that's exactly what happens here. And it's really not that hard to see it. The point that Paul makes in our passage and those passages is that does Paul please people? Sometimes he does. And sometimes he doesn't, just like us. If the wind happens to be behind him and he's with the Greeks sharing the gospel with the Greeks, he will please them by being like them for God and they're good. And if he's with the Judaizers and they want him to change his gospel, but it's going to damn the souls of the people he's preaching to, now the wind's blowing behind him to turn him around, now he's going to zigzag against the wind and continue in that direction and offend the Judaizers and say, as he does in chapter 5, I wish they'd emasculate themselves, anathema, anathema to them. Sometimes Paul pleases people for their good, Sometimes he doesn't. And in Galatians 1, which ones he's talking about? The Judaizers. And he's saying, I don't please them. And I don't please you if you want me to be like them. <laughs> but for your good. You can see this even in the passages I just quoted. It's very obvious. We don't have to do any gymnastics to believe this. For example, I said, quote, Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. So, it's not that he's now abandoning the Lord to please others, but it's a way of pleasing the Lord. We please others. Or, I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. Pleasing others for their good, not for me. The contrast here is not between, in these passages, is not between do I please God or or do I please people? That's Galatians 1 contrast. The other passages, the contrast is, do I please me or do I please others? And in those cases, I please others. That's what Paul says over and over. Let each of us please his neighbor. And he says, not ourselves. If you want a simple test then, to know that am I pleasing people in the bad way or the good way? then you just ask yourself the question, will my pleasing this person be useful to them or only useful to me? That's easy enough. Just keep that question with you. Will it be useful to them? And when I say useful to them, I don't mean the temporary good feeling you can give someone when you flatter them. I mean in an ultimate sense. It's really good for this person. It's really going to benefit them long term. Then you can and even must be pleasing to this person. Believer or unbeliever. But if it's not useful to them, but only to you, don't do it. Then you need to offend that person. For Christ's sake, you need to offend that person. Paul could have compromised his gospel. His kinsmen would love him. He would have been continuing to grow in popularity just like he was before he met Christ. He could have done it. But then the Galatians would be in hell today. Paul knew that. He said, I won't do it. And so instead, anathema on the Judaizers. Now, for us, we're not in Paul's exact same circumstance, but it's worthwhile considering why do we do the bad people pleasing? What are the benefits that we seek to get when we please people wrongly? And there are three that seem primary to me, and there's probably more. But consider just these. First, how many times... Have you pleased someone, not for them, but out of a motive of greed? This is the one that famously is talked about by Jesus' half-brother, James, in chapter 2 of his letter when he said, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For, here's the scenario, if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, 
and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, oh, you sit here in a good place, not the front row, that's never popular, third row, fourth row, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the other, you stand over there, or you sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? What are the evil thoughts or evil motivations? The evil thoughts are, if I treat the man with a gold ring well, maybe I'll get the gold ring. <laughs> if you have someone come in, and maybe we have to contextualize it for ourselves, not gold rings, but someone comes in and they're dressed well, they're put together, hair, everything's where it needs to be, and let's say they're emotionally mature, and they're they interact with you in a very healthy way, and they seem like someone who might be on the higher parts of society. You can just sense, the, sense that in some new visitor. You get to talk to them, and they know people, and they clearly have money, and maybe there's a lot of similarities between you and them, and you're excited to talk with them, and you hope you can get to know them more. That's not a problem. Great. Until someone else comes in, and they're not like that at all. And they're from some different demographic from yourself. And they're dressed shabbily. And they don't have all the social cues. And interaction's much more difficult. It takes much more work. And they don't seem like someone who's going to benefit you short or long term. It might be like, oh, this relationship might cost a lot of me. They need a lot of stuff. They don't have much to give. Now, these aren't things you go through consciously in your mind. But just look at how you act toward each of them. And you can see it's at play. Let's not pretend like it's not at play. It's at play. And if you don't consciously fight against that, it wins. You don't automatically overcome that. But you see what's happening there is you can even treat a new visitor to your church very well. And you say, I'm doing a great job with the visitor. And you can do it horribly. You can do it as bad people pleasing, thinking, wow, I'm going to get a lot. So greed is one reason. And you may see that it's a good challenge even in our friendships with each other. Of course, we're going to gravitate toward people who we're similar to, who share interests, because we receive a personal benefit. It's easier to say the least. But even more than that, maybe we'll be in hobbies together. We'll do things. Our kids are the same age. So we gravitate in that direction. But you realize that if you only gravitate in that direction... It's for you and it's not for them. If you don't have any friends in your life who aren't like you and don't offer you anything personally except good, encouraging spiritual conversation, if you don't have anybody in your life like that, you should go find somebody like that. Don't tell them that's who they are, you know. But you need to go find some people who don't give that require you to give and you'll be rewarded in the resurrection of the just. So this is one way that we people please in a bad sense. We find someone we think they can benefit us via greed, via social standing, via money. Pastors are especially prone to this, if you care to know, because you're looking at the budget and you're thinking, we can't offend so-and-so because they probably give a good amount, and if we don't have them, how are we going to function? But to be a faithful pastor, as you understand, just requires not caring about that and saying, if they leave because they have to leave, the Lord, I'm sure, will spare one of his cattle that he owns on all the thousand hills to care for us. So greed is one of those bad motives, selfish motives of bad people pleasing. Here is another one, pride. And it's the one that kills our evangelism, and you know it does. You don't want your coworkers to think that you're the religious zealot. You don't want them to think differently of you than anything than you're just one of them. But they don't care about Jesus. So if you bring Jesus into the conversation, it does change the dynamics. Some will respect you. Great. Many will not. Or you're afraid that if I start sharing the gospel, I'm going to get asked one of those hard questions I don't know the answer to, and I'm going to look like a fool. That's only your pride talking. That's only your pride talking. Looking like a fool never cost anybody anything, really. It's not even painful, except in, internally, to your pride. 
which licks its wounds. Sometimes this can be hidden for us. <laughs> I can only say these things because I do them, okay? But we're fighting against it. Sometimes we hide it with very good noble things like, I want to build the relationship first, <laughs> which sometimes can be legitimate, okay? Before I start sharing the gospel, I want to build the relationship first. Well, we ought to love people as more than just a project. We ought to love them, build the relationship, yes. But sometimes if you say, if I build a relationship, then I will share the gospel. You know that the then almost never happens. <laughs> it's just, if you miss the opportunity early on, it becomes harder and harder later to be the sort of person who shares the gospel. Because they say, what? Where did this come from? So it is our pride, again, that puts up the wall, says, later on, I don't want to change the way that they think of me right now. Are we seeking the approval of people? Or are we servants of Jesus Christ? The fact is that God approves of you sharing the gospel. And Christ, who's your master, has commanded you directly to go and make disciples of all the nations. So that's all you need. You don't need positive social cues coming back from the person you're sharing with. You don't need them to look like they're ready to hear the gospel from you. You don't need a depth of relationship where now you have credibility to speak into their life. All you need is to go and then to say the gospel. That's all you need. Let's not be unnecessarily offensive. Don't waste all of your employer's work time so they pay you a paycheck for doing nothing but sharing the gospel. You need to do what you're hired to do and don't be a distraction to others. But you know, even if you remove those opportunities of evangelizing that would hinder your work, you still have 80% of the opportunities to share the gospel after work or on break or whatever it is. We're not trying to be unnecessarily offensive, but so often it is our pride that causes us to be people pleasers in a bad way, where it's not for this person's good that I pretend there's no such thing as a gospel and just talk about sports. It doesn't help him. What would be good for this person is to risk the offense of sharing the gospel. But our pride often is a hindrance. Finally, let me share you, with you one bad motive that is the one that I deal with the most above all the rest, and maybe it's a subset of pride but it is simply unbelief. For me, at least, it becomes difficult to offend people when I need to because I don't always fully grasp onto the promise of the gospel that I have the approval of God. And if you don't grab that by faith to give you a real confidence in your life, then you go looking somewhere else for some fleece of Gideon, some confirmation that God does approve of you. And the place it seems to reside for me is in other people. If I feel that other people approve of me overall, then I interpret that as, well, if they approve of me, that must mean God approves of me. What an absolute train wreck of a mindset, I can tell you that. It's not healthy because the problem is going to be what happens when God, clearly in his word, calls you to offend people as he does. If you're interpreting their approval as God's approval, now you've got a collision of what God clearly says is his will and then other people's will, which I want them to like me. It becomes a real problem. It can't be done. I think that's why in a passage like this, he does set this contrast. He says, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Sometimes you can get both, but not all the time. There will come times often where the approval of man is here, the approval of God is here. You can't think they're the same thing. It's not good. You have to have the faith to believe. When you're up against a hostile culture, that thinks that your views are so outdated and TikTok is praising views that are different than your own and painting yours as Karen-like views and now you have to say you hold those views, you have to offend a lot of people, even if you do it very nicely. People have to not like you and think you're backwards and have all sorts of assumptions about the sort of person you are. And if you want to please God, if you want to be a servant of Christ, you have to do it. Unbelief says, I need people to like me or I don't feel like a good Christian. You can't be a good Christian if somebody doesn't like you. Jesus said, beware when everyone speaks well of you. We have to have a faith in God's word by itself. Whether culture likes it or doesn't, whether your coworkers approve or not, 
faith in God's word so that I can move this way when the wind blows this way. So that I am willing to borrow a phrase very popular right now for our own purposes, though. Speak the truth to power. When there is an intense sway, perhaps it's to those who are above you and they are pressuring you to compromise, you have to have a confidence that comes from faith in God's word that I will not compromise. Let the rulers of the earth stand together against the Lord and his anointed. That kind of confidence comes from faith. If you don't have it, you will look for approval in people. Paul himself, you'll see, was not partial and not swayed by these things. We're going to see that in this first chapter. How many times he says, those who seem to be influential, what they were, doesn't matter to me. God's not partial. And then he says, I called Peter out to his face. <laughs> we're going to see that. So there is the example of Paul for us, that he was not these things. If you find yourself trying to make others smile, but out of these motives, we have to stop. Make them smile for good reasons, for their benefit, but not for these reasons. This is the first and the easiest part of the sermon. As we move to the conclusion, you may be saying, I already knew that. <laughs> I already knew that I shouldn't do that. I already know that I should be sharing the gospel with my coworkers or my mom friends. I already know it. The hard thing is how do you do it? How do you stop being a bad people pleaser when you so much crave the approval of others? Maybe you're one of those who avoids conflict at all costs. I cannot have it because you can't sleep at night if somebody doesn't like you. So now what do you do? How do you overcome that? I can't give you a full answer here, but I do think our text gives a beginning of an answer. If you look at the last part of it where Paul says, If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. There is a lot of hope to be derived from that single word, still. Because it suggests that Paul did at one time seek to please man. But he doesn't still do it. Paul himself, as he tells us here and in Philippians chapter 3, was a celebrity among the Jewish people when he was not a Christian. He was up and coming. We're going to see this actually in just four verses where he'll say, quote, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. And the Jewish people loved Paul. He studied under Gamaliel, one of the greatest of the Jewish rabbis. He was up and coming. He was popular. He was loved by his country. Don't you want to be the person that on social media, everybody loves you. There's so much political division, but every once in a while, there's a sort of person that it seems like everyone really loves this person for some act of heroism, if you will. That was Paul. The Jewish people really loved what he was doing. And then he's on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians, and he becomes one. And he takes his popularity and tosses it out the window. And he won't leave Damascus except in a basket as his countrymen try to kill him. There was a time when Paul was a people pleaser. When he was receiving personal benefit. Probably this idea of approval from God because my Jewish kinsmen approve of me. But he was receiving a personal benefit by speaking lies and persecuting Christians. It was a work of the devil. But he got something out of it. So he persisted in it, in ignorance. But now when he speaks in Galatians 1.10, notice this is a conditional statement that begins with an if, meaning he doesn't do it. This is what we call a second class conditional, which means the if part of it is not true, nor is the then part of it true. If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ, but he is a servant of Christ. I think for Paul, that's what helped him the most, not to be a bad people pleaser, is his own awareness that he was called to be a servant of Christ. Every letter begins, Paul, an apostle. Paul set apart for the gospel. Paul is a servant. Paul a servant. Paul a servant of Jesus Christ. Some of you have read the book, when People Are Big and God Is Small by Ed Welch. If you struggle with people pleasing and you haven't read it, go read it. An excellent book. The main argument that Dr. Welch makes in that book 
is you may think that if you struggle being a people pleaser and wanting everyone's approval all the time, then the way to solve that is just like the world says, if you have low self-esteem, you need to get high self-esteem, have a better opinion of yourselves. And sometimes the Christian alternative to that is, if you need people's approval, you just need to know that God approves of you the end. Now, there's some real truth to that. But this book by Ed Welch, when people are big and God is small, he pushes back against that thought, says that's one piece of it. But if you really want to overcome people pleasing, it's not just you thinking God approves of me in the gospel, therefore I don't need anything else. That's a big part of it. But if you want to overcome the fear of people, says Welch, the primary thing you need is a fear of God. The fear that is a reverence, the fear that is an awe, that is an amazement, a sense of the grandeur and the greatness and the authority of God and his Christ. That helps you more than knowing God approves of you, though he does in the gospel, you should know that. I think that's Paul's thinking here in this passage because he says, if I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. It's his sense that he is a servant of Christ that leads him to say, I'm not trying to please people because I'm a servant of Christ. It is a sense of the greatness of Christ. Philippians 3, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for which I trade everything. Paul did not fear people because he feared God. It's the only way we overcome people pleasing in the end is to have a massive sense of God's greatness bigness. People will always be big while God is small to us. But when God is big to us, then people become small to us. When we have a sense that we are servants of Christ and he is great and he has commanded us to evangelize and sometimes to say difficult, controversial things, if we have that sense, then we continue sailing our ship in that direction. We don't care what the wind does inconvenient if it's for us that's fine but we have to sail that way because we have a vision of Christ and his grandeur his greatness like Psalm chapter 2 where God sits in the heavens and he laughs when all the nations conspire against him and his Christ he's not concerned because he's massive he's great the waters are in the palm of his hand so your one single co-worker in the year 2022 who sits beside you and might be a bit put off if you talk about Jesus is not a concern to God. <laughs> it's a concern to you, but not to God. If we have a sense of his greatness, the massiveness of all God is and does, that's what allows us to denounce false teachers that's what allows us to be controversial when we need to be controversial. That's what allows us to risk being considered religious zealots and Karens and everything else for the sake of the gospel. It's when we live in the wonder of Christ, then people become small. And may God grant that for all of us here at Faith Bible Church, we wouldn't be characterized by people pleasing, if, even if it is a struggle, but that what we would think of ourselves and what others would know of us above everything else is that this is a church made up of servants of Jesus Christ.